Welcome to the Funnel Reboot Podcast, brought to you by Marketing What's New. Let's get into today's show. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot. Today, we're continuing our series on revenue ops. First, please let me remind you, Universal Analytics is soon going away. You have a limited amount of time to create your Google Analytics for property, and you don't want Google doing that for you, which is something they've announced that they're doing. Let's get to today's show. This is the second part of a four-part series on revenue operations. We can never forget that the marketing function sits inside the broader work of acquiring customers. The purpose of this series is to evangelize this relatively new framework so that everyone gets on board with it. This episode's guests has been leading the movement that we know now as Revenue Ops ever since she started calling for the shift from traditional marketing strategies to what she coined as Revenue Marketing back in 2011. From that time on, I've personally followed what she has to say about this. As partner and chief strategy officer of the Pedowitz Group, she has helped marketing teams with their transformation to RevOps. She has proven over and over that this strategic approach earns marketing a seat at the table. She earned her doctorate in 2019 from the U of Phoenix. Her thesis focused on how marketing leadership should operate in a digital-first environment. And that, along with prolific series of articles and blogs and podcasts and white papers, brought our guest to finally write a book in 2021, and that is what we are talking about today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Debbie Gagish. I'm so glad to welcome Debbie Gagish. Welcome to the show, Debbie. Glenn, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Well... And it was a pleasure to read your book, and it's called From Backroom to Boardroom, Earn Your Seat with Strategic Marketing Operations. Um, I know, long title. (laughs) It's good, but it's specific. And it's specific about a part of the marketing function that, depending on how long people have been in the field, uh, they may not have a whole lot of grounding in. Because it's not all that old when we consider it, right? So maybe maybe take me through how did this marketing operation function even come to exist? That's a great question, and I, it's one that I get asked a lot. So let me kind of give you a little bit of background on that. You know, for a long time, marketing has felt pressure to contribute to revenue. I mean, study after study tells us that you know, mid-sized company, large company, even small companies, even probably even more so in small companies, the head of marketing is now being held accountable for revenue. And they've tried and they've tried and they've tried, yet still only about 30% of heads of marketing report any kind of financial results, even though they are drowning in enabling technology. I mean, even a small to medium-sized firm probably uses 10 to 15 different pieces of technology that really fully enable them to make an impact on revenue, yet they keep missing the mark. So some few years back, I'd probably say it really became became to get a really popularity started probably about five years ago. This whole notion of marketing operations came into being. And marketing operations was that part of the organization, uh, the side of the brain that thinks analytically, not the creative side, right? And so they were responsible for optimizing the technology, for being all about the data, about being analytical, right? And it was that capability that finally allowed marketing to connect to revenue, so, and, and you see the growth of marketing operations being sometimes it's just a single person who might be running the Marketo, the Pardot, or the HubSpot instance. Yes. And that's the beginning of it, right? Yeah. To get the most out of the technology that you have. 
And then it grows and eventually becomes a dedicated function to encompass reporting, data, analytics, which are all critical to marketing being able to demonstrate their impact on revenue. And so it has been a fast growth, probably one of the fastest growing parts of marketing. I mean, I've seen organizations go from zero to, you know, two, three, four, five dedicated people who who are just working on that. Because again, it's the return on that investment technology, but it's also how you go to market in a digital age where it's all about the customer. Nobody's better positioned to do that than the marketing organization. So that's a little bit about the history. Fabulous. And you're right. There's a, uh, a lot that, I mean, the internet has brought customers to, you know, the forefront of having power. Um, and yet we shouldn't just throw up our hands and say, we're powerless. This particular function has so much in the way of data and tools that it can kind of meet that challenge, right? You know, you and I were talking about um, Eloqua in the early days, and we were talking about Steve Woods, who was one of the co-founders of Eloqua, I believe. And Steve wrote a book, gosh, I guess it came out in 2012, called Digital Body Language, right? And it was all about, you know, the digital body language, how people are interacting online, how they're interacting with your content, with your pages, where they're going on the internet, everything that Amazon does to us every single day. Sure. And marketing is sitting on top of this goldmine of digital body language data, right? And it's really the marketing ops capability or function that helps mine that and make it useful for marketing. Yeah, they have uh, that opportunity. Mm-hmm. However, um, at the beginning of the book, we're faced with a harsh reality coming to those individuals that are marketing automation administrators. Um, and that is, you see there being a lot of potential that is squandered and that they've been kind of boiled down to their lowest level. They, they may be tasked by let's say a director of sales, you know, could you just set this campaign up for me? Or they aren't asked their advice. They're just dished out orders. What do you call that? Button pushers. So, and I got to tell you, the whole idea for the book came some years ago. Uh, It wasn't that many, but I was, I was, I was doing a talk at a MarTech conference on the West coast. And I, my audience was filled with marketing operations people. And I referred to marketing operations people as being button pushers. Well, you would have thought I reached into their chest and ripped out their hearts. There there was such a visceral reaction to that. And, and I already knew that, but you know, that, that really proved it. And so I said, you know, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to set that story straight To Mm -hmm. your point, Glenn, if you're not using marketing operations in a more strategic way, you are squandering the opportunity. You are not really getting the most out of your investment. Because think about what a marketing operations uh, team does. They're looking at the data. They're analytical. They're the ones who set up all the technology that's having all of these digital interactions with the customer. Who better to get advice from about what and how you should be doing differently to better capture the attention of your audience in a digital world? There there is nobody better than that. They sit there every day obsessing around this and, you know, eight levels up, you know, they're making strategic decisions in the company, but they're making those decisions without understanding the power and the possibilities that they have in a marketing operations team. And so when I see those two things come level, when those two things see eye to eye, you have a completely different role of marketing. It's important. It's about revenue. It's about growth. And it's about creating shareholder value. Yeah, it's it's far more than just, um, I've got the data in front of me. What can I do with it? Oh, I know. I can total it and give a summary report to my boss to show how many impressions we had or how many email signups. Um, the, the, when we, it, this becomes abundantly obvious to me when we flip around to a prospect's 
point of view. You say in one point that, and we've all witnessed this, anybody in B2B, we get a call from a rep and uh, followed up by an email and a few. And, you know, we, the prospect, do nothing. But then it gets quiet. But then a new guy (laughs) comes along and they do the same thing for another month or two. And then maybe that gets quiet again. And or worship, we never get contacted by another one. It's like we're just lost in the shuffle, even though we, you know, put our email address in at one point. And you see, it can even the travesty can even get worse. The nightmare can continue with marketing, then nabbing us again through some retargeting, and they've bought us as a contact once more. And you know, we go through this washing machine cycle again. Um, this, this, as you said. The marketer, the specifically the marketing operations crew, is sitting on top of this data. They ought to be able to see this entire thing. This should never happen, right? We should be actually elevating this so that we can make these interactions way better than they are. That's right. We, we, we really should be able to. And again, post-pandemic, you know, a lot of things have changed. The world is more digital than ever before. Uh, even we find that in, in sales studies, uh, prospects and customers actually want less face-to-face, you know, right. uh, c- come to my, you know, they, they're just as happy to do things digitally. And the customer truly has so much control. So part of what marketing operations is chartered with is standing back at Poche and taking a look at that entire customer journey along with sales and along with the customer support team, along with all the customer facing parts of the organization, right? Taking a look at that entire customer journey and saying, you know, what data, what analytics, what content do we have and who does what where. And that is the only way that you're ever going to get a customer centric organization. And a lot of times I find it's marketing operations that's trying to lead that charge to let's get this one view to the customer, not just to create an MQL from marketing, right? Because again, marketing's ability to see what people are doing in the, in, in the, in, in the, in, on the internet, on your pages, it, it's not just about getting them as a net new customer. It's, it's, it's all the way through, right? So you should never have that washing cycle of, you know, this mm-hmm. lead comes through, it's lost, and, and then you, and you're rebuying and recreating over and over. You should have that one view mapped out of the entire customer life cycle with your company and who does what, who has the data, and marketing has data along the entire journey. As long as you have prospects and customers that are doing anything online, marketing has data about what they're doing. And that data is real time, and that data doesn't lie. Like, for example, how many times do you see people put Mickey Mouse on a form, right? Yet, if you already know who it is, you know it's Debbie Gagish who filled out the form. She can put whatever name she wants on there, right? Right. So the data that they have and their ability to work with the other parts of the organization to get that one view of the customer is what is what stops that washing machine. We buy leads over and over and allows the company to be having this ongoing adult relevant conversation with the market. And it's, and it's marketing that does that powered by strategic marketing operations. When you look at the companies you do consulting and coaching with, they're at all different stages of being able to attain this, you know, future goal that you've talked about. Some of them have a repeatable process, but it's not quite predictable. Some of them have something that is predictable, but it's not scalable. They, they, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. So the book, and I'm going to encourage people to, you know, head to uh, the show notes and even better get the book so you can see the models here, but you have a model for this. Anybody listening to this, if you email me, Debbie at PetowitzGroup.com, I'll give you a free e-copy. Wonderful. Happy to do that. So the model that you propose that explains how they get from wherever they are to this end point is the marketing operations model. Can you tell me what it has? Sure, sure, absolutely. 
And there are five stages to it. And this is just what I've seen over and over and over again. And so the first stage is unaware. The second stage is efficient and effective. Third stage is about getting revenue. The next stage is about being customer centric. And then the last stage I call next generation because that's where a whole lot of change takes place. And so I'll I'll talk about each of these. So um, at one point when I was working with the model, and this is probably the third iteration of the model that I have uh, done since 2015, and the first stage is unaware. And I had people say to me, well, Debbie, everybody's aware. Yeah, no, they're not. I, I truly was sitting with a CMO just a couple of years ago, and I said, uh, well, you know, what are you doing about marketing operations? And he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, you know, I've heard of that. Oh, boy. Right? Because a lot of times what happens is that the CMOs or these VPs of marketing have more of a brand background than they sure. do a, a revenue background. And, and so, so we still have a cadre of companies of all different sizes that are still pretty much um, unaware that this should be a thing. And then the efficient and effective stage is where a company begins with maybe one or two people dedicated into the marketing operations role, and they're efficient. They're doing things very well with the tools that they have. And again, even small companies have 10 to 15 different pieces of MarTech technologies. Your larger companies can have as many as 50 pieces of technology or, or more. It's just the proliferation of technology, as you know, is just crazy. And then also being effective, are they, are they doing the right things? And there's often a lot of excitement in that efficient and effective stage yeah. because this is where marketing operations comes into being. This is where you optimize the use of the technology. This is where you begin to optimize the use of data. And it's just a very exciting stage. And, and, and setting that fundamental platform in place is really important for the next age. And so after you've got that platform efficient and effective, we see marketing ops really move into, okay, all right, let's help marketing be accountable for revenue. We've learned all the puts and takes. We've learned all about the data. We've got the systems. We, we, you know, we, we got our, our, we got an arm around that. And now we know that we can take what we've learned and we can help marketing be accountable for revenue. And again, that's through the data, through the analytics, and through the use of the technology. So that's that's really next. And then the next stage is being customer centric. And somebody asked me, I was doing a presentation, and they said, why isn't being customer centric before get revenue? Hmm. And I said, really, this is kind of more like a timeline of how I see uh, marketing ops grow. That's just what I see. I typically don't see it the other way. I see efficient and effective. And then I see, okay, now we can be accountable for revenue. And then I see them say, okay, now it's time to be customer centric because being customer centric is an accelerator of getting to revenue. Right. And it's really just been the past well, two or, years. Or we could even look at it the other way. If we have a promise of being customer centric, but we are asking management for all this money for technology and we haven't even proven that that money can get us that, revenue that's, that's exactly right <laughs> that's that's exactly right glenn you're you're, sp- <laughs> you're spot on with that and and also because companies have been slow to go on you know pivoting from being product focused to customer centric companies have been slow to go and the pandemic has pushed them way over the edge right but we know that companies that are customer centric if they've got that marketing operations foundation, they accelerate the impact on revenue. It's just we, we see that in company after company after company. And then the last stage is popular and unpopular. And let me tell you why. So the last stage is what I call next gen or next generation. And this is where sales ops, marketing ops and customer success ops becomes one operations organization. Yeah. Typically reports to a CRO or a COO, never reports to the CMO, which is why it's unpopular. But when you have that type of RevOps organization, it is completely driven by two things. Number one is getting one view to the customer. And number two is accelerating revenue and growth. Right. And so, again, 
And, and I see um, a lot of organizations, especially your larger organizations, they are not going to reorganize like that. Too much legacy, too much politics. But your medium-sized organizations, your smaller organizations, and actually all the case studies I have around RevOps and my book are from small to medium-sized companies because they're more agile. They, they yes. have... They have fewer blockades. They've got fewer barriers. They're able to do things more quickly. And one of the great examples in my book is a, is a company called Paycor, which is a medium-sized company. Uh, Brian Vass um, has run the RevOps organization there. And again, the value in creating that one operations set, it's one set of data, one view of the customer, one integrated set of technologies reporting is it, it is just it, it makes a huge difference in an organization. So I actually see that ability to pivot toward a rev ops, which is the end of the marketing operations mm-hmm. you know, uh, continuum. Yes. At an advantage of a small to medium sized company. Yeah, the. Uh at each one of the stages, I think it's instructive to know you were describing that, you know, you need to get ahead in one particular aspect, but you need to be able to also reformulate it for the next stage, right? What got you there won't get you here. That's exactly um, right. It, one of the things that the sales and marketing uh, component, when you're looking to merge those, it seemed to me you were saying that, yeah, we can't think of it as being... I've got um, my marketing and my, my campaign and branding crew, then be, in essence, the, the, the flow of the, the assembly line would be marketing operations and then my SDRs and then I'm into full-blown sales. Instead, you said, think of it as a layer that sits underneath all of them. And one layer, like with one team that has their own huddles and is able to discuss, Mm -hmm. oh, well, I've been working with this group over here Mm -hmm. to enable something. That's right. You know, let's, let's integrate it with that other system, right? So that, wow, for some organizations, this is going to be a a seismic change. Imagine, and again, Paycor is a great example, and and, uh, Brian Vass will tell you that his VP of revenue just always had that vision, right? And um, imagine uh, having that one view to the customer, no matter what part of the organization they were working with, and having an integrated stack, MarTech stack, whether it's sales, marketing, customer success, that would you know, create the data, capture the data, do the reporting and ensure that, you know, you've got a a happy customer, right? I mean, there really is nothing more powerful than that to, to drive revenue. And there is an, there is an interim step because, because again, customers always ask us, you know, we're not going to reorganize, right? And even some larger mid-sized companies say, we're not going to reorganize the Politics around that are are massive. So the interim step is to create a center of excellence for RevOps, a RevOps center of excellence. And that's kind of a a midterm step. Yeah. And, you know, in the real world also, we have to be able to prove street cred, Um, particularly, you know, if marketing hasn't shown value to sales in the past. Um, I pulled out one particular thing that really jumped at me in terms of how this could be done from the marketing operations perspective. You talked about a new marketing operations leader who was very quantitative. And after she was hired, uh, she her, her area of focus immediately went to MQL conversions. And it seems, based on how I heard it, that there was, you know, a longstanding tradition of this is the way we score leads. And, you know, those marketing yahoos, they just can't get it straight. There's not enough leads coming through and, you know, sales is bashing them and marketing has nothing to say back. You said this person dug into the data, into how lead scoring was done, and that she found some kind of tribal information approach. Can you tell me what the rest of the story was from there? Uh, absolutely. So it is, I, I, I got to tell you, Glenn, I never thought we'd be sitting here in 2022 and still have the gap between sales and marketing. I know. Too, right. But I guess that's the reason I still have a successful company. <laughs> right. Um, 
So I think what happens is that a lot of times sales does not see value in marketing. And again, when sales has that limited view, if I got to produce an MQL and it's a factory line and it goes over to sales, that's really kind of the missing piece. What's really interesting is as you grow a marketing operations capability, even if you only have two or three people dedicated to that role, they become like Switzerland between sales and marketing. I have seen small marketing operations teams um, be able to work with sales in a way that marketing just never could because marketing just doesn't approach it with data. They don't approach with analytics and the marketing operations team does. I mean, a few years ago, I was talking to a good friend of mine, Dan Brown, who was head of marketing operations for Verant. And I said, Dan, I said, what is it that marketing operations does that sales will listen and interact with marketing operations where they wouldn't give marketing the time of day? And he says, Debbie, they have credibility because they have data, because they are analytical, because they look at insights. And when you have a marketing operations team that does that, you don't have to rely on tribal knowledge. Hmm. So for example, today, and it's such a shame, it's such a shame, Glenn. I walk into a marketing organization and I say, how do you know who your customer is? They say, we ask sales, right? That's what they, we, we talk to sales and sales is completely tribal knowledge. Yes. It's, it's good qualitative Mm -hmm. if you go broadly, but if you just talk to one or two salespeople, you're going to get a skewed view of what, who that customer is and what they want. But Marketing with marketing operations, again, we talked about it sitting on this goal mine of digital body language that is real time, right? It's not, it, you don't, it, it's not like you can get data about this that happened three months ago because it takes that long to put together a report. True. It's real time actionable data. And I think that that is what gives marketing street cred is when you can come with data, when you can come with analytics. That is the thing that that, you know, sales is happy to provide that street cred, but if you can also give them data about their prospects and who they're going after, that's real time. That is gold to a salesperson. That is how you get them to be part of your team. Yeah. You and I both know that, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and the, right. So sales is, and I think we're both uh, we've been in this long enough to have both seen bull sessions, that's what I call them, where, you know, especially going back to the days of out, outside sales reps, they'd come back at the end of the day, there's a little bit of a, a stand around the coffee machine or maybe, you know, in the in the open area, you know, the bull pit, and they're saying, you know, anecdotally what they were seeing from accounts during the day. That can permeate the other reps and they will use that in their future thinking that that is the latest and greatest data around, Mm -hmm. you know, what Mm -hmm. they have to do to get their quarterly Mm -hmm. numbers, what they have to do to be able to ensure the long-term viability of the company. Meanwhile, I'm sure some marketing, marketing person, a marketing ops person is crying because it, it doesn't look anything like the rich and textured data that they have. I'm taking a moment to talk about the new Google Analytics. In early 2023, the in-person GA Fast Forward workshops will happen in Ottawa, Kingston, Montreal, as well as across upstate New York. You can go now and see registration details or get notified when it's happening in your area. Just go to gafastforward.com, spelled as you'd say it, or GAFAST, the number four, then W-A-R-D. Let's get back to the conversation. Part, part of what you describe as marketing's fault, and I have actually come in and helped marketing operations for sure, but marketing in general, rebrand themselves within their organization. Because sometimes when you're so far back with credibility, even though you're bringing data forward, that you know that data might be uh, suspect, right? Yep. But you... But when it comes to sales, I mean, today, you know, 
Well, I'll give you a story. So I bought Eloqua in 2007. I was customer 12. Wow. I just found that out. I didn't realize I was so early. And my background prior to that was I had been a VP of sales for many years. So I, I carry a bag. I was a VP of sales for both national and international companies. And in this company, I had an equity position and I was the VP of marketing. The minute I saw what Eloqua, what these tools could do, I knew that marketing and sales was forever changed. Having that real-time digital body language at your fingertips so that you could make informed decisions about, you know, when you're in a uh, an account pursuit was just gold. Yeah. Yet it's taking years for that type of capability to get into the hands of salespeople because marketing has failed to provide that to them, even though they could. And again, marketing operations is that's one of the big gaps that they close. At the same time, we now see a whole bunch of sales enablement tools that the sales organization is going out and buying so they can kind of see more of that digital body language. And they're not depending on marketing because, again, marketing has failed to close that gap with the sales organization. But when you have a when you have a strategic marketing ops organization, they they are Switzerland in so many ways, and they do a, a very good job of bringing sales and marketing together, taking a look at data, taking a look at actionable insights, and we see you know this collaboration between sales and marketing. We call it what we talk about is uh, there's a new way to create revenue, and it's called a revenue team. And the revenue team consists of marketing and sales for sure in the world that we live in. Yeah, we have to end. If we're going to bring in something new, we've got to let go of the old. And the, the thing you target there is lead management, right? We, mm -hmm. we, we've got to stop thinking of this like some relay race where marketing is only responsible to get it to the lead. And then, you know, they, they take off and, it you know. It doesn't work. It, no. Let me tell you, it doesn't work. I'll tell you a funny story. I got my doctorate degree in 2019, I believe. And when you write a dissertation, you have to have a gap analysis. And my gap analysis was marketing is drowning in enabling technology, yet only 30% report financial results. Yeah. It took me three years to get my dissertation written. And I was so afraid that gap was going to like, you know, go away. And it didn't. It stayed the same, Glenn, and it's still the same today. Yes. Yeah. But, but I will say this. Your smaller and more mid-sized companies, those marketing organizations tend to have a bigger impact on revenue than the larger organizations. Again, wow. it's because of their agility. and It's because they can better connect to the sales organization. And um, again, that's where we're seeing most of the innovation, especially around RevOps or, or in mid-sized organizations. Yes, there's uh, now a bunch of great tools for closing that gap, but you will not finish the book before you deal with the fact that we've got to upgrade our people. And I'm wondering what you can tell me about how we need to be prepared for a couple of harsh realities when it comes to sourcing and uh, developing the people that are actually going to help pull us off. Well, I think everybody listening to this podcast knows the reality of how difficult it is to find talent. It is the, it is the number one issue within marketing teams today. And to find somebody that is a marketing operations professional Good luck because you're truly looking for a purple unicorn. They have to be technical. They have to be analytical. They have to understand business and they have to understand marketing and they have to act like Switzerland. They got to have great collaboration skills, right? Yeah. Well, you point out and it, it actually, I, I found that affirming because most people in marketing leadership positions, um, it's hard for them to see the skills that they themselves have, but that also uh, th that makes them unable to see why it's so hard to find those people. When you sum it all up and you explain how many different stakeholders a marketer is going to have to deal with, 
yeah, you're right. That's not, you know, sales. No, you, you need skills, but it's narrower. Service, it you know, same thing. It is. Marketing's one of these where, wow, we, we've got to have that data literacy all the way over to high EQ, right? That's right. So yeah. what do we what do we do between either finding them or if we have found somebody that has a few of them, developing them? Well, let me tell you another story about finding this talent. So um, I do one class a year at the College of William and Mary in the MBA program, and I've done it for 11 years. And many years ago, I began bringing other professionals with me. And probably about four years ago, I, I started bringing in marketing operations professionals because I wanted to introduce this group of MBA students to the world of marketing operations as well. And one year I, I brought Dan Brown, who I've mentioned before, he was VP of uh, marketing ops at, at Verant. And Dan does this great presentation around what his marketing operations team does and the impact that they have and the technologies that they use and how their data and analytical and the, the group of MBA students, they were just gobsmacked. They loved it. And so at the end of it, one enterprising young MBA student raised his hand and he said, Mr. Brown, he said, this sounds wonderful. How do we, how do we begin a career in marketing ops? You know, how, how, would, how do we come to work for you? And Dan looked at them and he said, you know, I wouldn't hire any of you. Oof. And you could have heard a pin drop. And his point was, you're, you're just, I, I need skills. I need experience if you're yeah. going to come to work in a marketing ops team. So, and there's really nowhere that a CMO or a VP can go to, th there's no ready-made factory, except for my friend Toby Murdoch has a company called Highway Education, and he has the first ever training curriculum. It's a four-month hands-on practical training curriculum for marketing operations professionals. He, he's, his, his second cohort is going now, but nowhere else can you go. So you either have to, the most popular thing to do is to borrow from other parts of the organization, yes. right? So it could be IT, it could be in marketing, it could be on a, on a data side, but you know, you'll bring them into marketing operations the slow boat to China is to hire somebody and try to, you know, bring them up. But that's going to be catch as catch can because it just depends on the projects that's happening. Um, and then, of course, you can hire very high priced talent. And the salaries from marketing operations professionals are through the roof right now. Again, uh, yeah. And I let's right look up. at let's look at the organizations that are selling that talent, um, renting. Um, we have the what also uh, stand as the big five accounting firms, right? They have mm -hmm. all got these consultancy branches with digital MO experts, but you're going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it. And that's probably one of the fastest growing parts of our business. We do marketing operations as a managed service for organizations um, because again, they, th there's a, there's a real appetite to do this, but to find the talent is it's just expensive. It's very, very expensive. And so a lot of times we'll do it as a managed service to get them from point A to point D, sure. right? And in the meantime, we're up training the people that they have and they can bring in more people. And a lot of times that's how they're successful because, you know, once you realize you need marketing operations, there no grass grows under your feet. You go from zero to some number very, very quickly, because, it, you know, it used to just grow organically, you know, but now when people realize there's a need for it, like, for example, this one company I'm working with, an extremely large national insurance organization, has gone from zero to 30 in like six months, wow. right? And that's a big company. I've also seen another large technology company go from zero to 100 in about six months, right? So, but once you understand you need this capability, you know, you're going to get a dedicated team of one, two, three people, however many you need to support your organization. And isn't that, that's uplifting, I think. So many marketers have been beaten down with their CFOs in past trying to argue for stuff. But those stories that you tell, I suppose what had to happen was that the uh, MO leader had to point the way to how the stack of tools aligns over the different parts of the journey. They also had to 
express how they would be accountable for revenue and not just qualified leads. You know, but if we if we set upon this journey, that's that's something that we stand to gain, and you know, for our careers, for uh, helping the company as a whole. I mean, that's that that's a very a optimistic a future. It's a heck of a career direction, let me Correct. tell you. And here's the, other, here's the other way to think about the head of marketing ops. It is the CMO's best wink person ever, right? Because when a CMO or a VP of marketing goes into the executive meeting, whether it's at a board level or, you know, executive leadership, and they say, you know, we changed the color of the website and we've got new branding, yeah, nobody cares, Right. If, you, if they come in and they can say, here's the impact that we had on revenue last quarter, that's great. But if they can also say, here is also what we forecast to impact revenue in the upcoming quarter, that's really when you've got a VP of marketing who is, you know, you know connected to sales. And it shows that marketing can drive revenue and growth and shareholder value. That's the kind of CMO or the VP of marketing that everybody wants to be. And that is what marketing operations enables. Yeah, we've gone 180 degrees from button pushing to even the board asking this function to advise on how best to achieve the company's objectives. Mm-hmm. Right? Like that's, Absolutely. I, I think if you're going to work hard, you know, in a, in, a, in a job function, that's the kind of reward that I think makes working hard worth it. Absolutely, it does. But it requires a CMO or a VP of marketing who knows how to leverage that. And quite often, I see where they don't. They, they really do not know how to leverage that. And that's really more your, your brand and communication. And not, not to say there's not a place for those kinds of leaders. Sure. But if, if you're not a VP of marketing or a CMO, and if you're not focused on driving revenue, you really will not know how to best optimize marketing operations. Yeah, there's a there's accountability all around and we all have choices in our career. So whether you're the, you know, senior leader who recognizes you need to upskill or you're the junior who's in an organization where you just see it's not going to happen. The, the onus is on us to, you know, pull up ourselves by our bootstraps and, you know, achieve the vision that you've pointed out. That's that right. takes us out of the back room and That's puts right. us right in the boardroom. Right. And, you know, and I, and I will just say, I will say this to everybody that's listening. If you're not in an organization where you can grow like this, go to another organization, right? Because that's the only way you're really going to progress in your careers. Find an organization where you can get what you want out of your career. And there's a lot of opportunities out there. And, Debbie knows whereof she speaks. Debbie, if people want to find out, uh, you've already told them about how to get the book, but if you could tell us once more about your yeah, Pedowitz Group and how people can get a hold of you. Yeah, Debbie at PedowitzGroup.com is my email. I'm also very active on LinkedIn, just Debbie Guy Geesh at LinkedIn. Uh, those are two ways that you can reach out to me. And again, I'd love to give anybody a free copy of the book. Just say you heard it on Glenn's podcast and I will send you a link for a free copy. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much again. And to the listener, I hope that this inspired you, no matter where you are on this uh, five-stage journey or in your own career journey. Take something away from it. Think about how you can implement it and share this episode with someone else you know who could also benefit from it. And I hope that this has given you some way to make your funnel even better. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.